Greetings, my name is David Rachels. I'm an English professor at Newberry College in Newberry, South Carolina. Uh, in addition to my duties uh, as a teacher and administrator here at the school, I'm also a writer. Uh, I write crime fiction. Uh, and I'm sitting here with two of my colleagues who also uh, write crime fiction. Uh, on my left is Warren Moore. Uh, and on my right is Lawrence Block. Uh, one of us is a really famous crime writer. Uh, I will leave it to our viewers to figure out which is which uh, over the course of our conversation. And it isn't me. And it might not be me either, uh, but we're going to talk about some, uh, some issues related to uh, writing. Um, what we write, how we do it, uh, and so on. Uh, hopefully you all will find this uh, entertaining, enjoyable, maybe a little instructive. <laughs> You're dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, maybe, uh, well, maybe none of the above. And, you know, the, there, will always, there are always cat videos on YouTube. There are always cat videos on YouTube and TikTok and so on. Yeah. Um, so first, let's just talk about the kind of stuff we write, uh, the themes, the content. Um, I'll start with you, Warren. Um, when you sit down to write another story, um, how specific a theme, a subject matter uh, do you have in mind? Do you have a little niche that you see yourself as trying to fill? Um, re really, you know, I, I, don't, I don't tend to think in terms of theme until after the fact. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm occasionally given given a prompt, or you know, um, write something write something that um, you know write something that's dark, or write something that's involved with education, or you know something like that. But um, you know, other than that, I, I just kind of write whatever stories come to me, and then at, and then at the end, when I go back and I re -re and I read either that story or maybe several stories together, I start saying, oh, okay, these seem to have this in common, but it's not, it's not like I it's not like I usually set out to, you know, I'm not Western Union. It's not like, you know, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to deliver some great message. I'm, I'm mainly just trying to tell a good story. Okay. Larry, how about you? Uh, I never think in terms of theme either. Um, these days I don't write a whole lot, but I used, used to write a, a great deal more. And each time it would just be a matter of uh, trying to write a story and how they originate varies considerably from mm -hmm. story to story. Mm -hmm. There are times when, um, when all I have is an opening in mind. There are times when I'll, I have a, a conversation in mind and I see where it goes. Mm -hmm. There are times where I have various plot uh, elements in mind and uh, there are times when I have almost the whole story in my head when I sit right. down. So it's, it's infinitely variable. Yeah. Do you, you ever think How about, about you? Um, I, yeah, I never have anything like theme consciously in mind, at least when I start. Um, you know, my stories grow out of something small, usually. It might be an opening, it might be a character, it might be a prompt, it might be a title. Occasionally I'll have an ending in mind mm -hmm. and you know, work, work backwards like Poe. Um, but that's, that's, not, that's not very often. Um, sometimes I'll think more about theme when I'm revising. Do, do you have that? Like you'll, you'll kind of realize that there's some particular uh, idea or at least a tone that's embodied in the story and you realize you've got to bring that up more and, and tamp other stuff down? Well, um, I, I, th I think about as close as I get to that because, you know, I, I, I actually don't do all that much revising, and that, that probably comes from, you know, b before, before I became, became a, a fiction writer on a more or less regular basis, I'd been a journalist for six mm -hmm. years. And um, so I was used to, you know, getting a story written. There wasn't going to be a lot of rewrite, and, and so, you know, a, 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 lot of, a lot of the stuff I write, I don't revise that much. Okay. Occasionally, though, um, you know, the, I'll get a situation where it's like, okay, you know, I might hear a voice that, that I'm using when I'm writing a story, and I'll think, okay, the voice kind of falters here, and, mm -hmm. and you know, how, how would my grandfather or whoever's voice I'm kind of channeling, yeah, how, how, would, um, how, how would he have actually said this part? Right. But, yeah, you know, I, I don't do a whole lot of su substantial revision. Do you read it aloud when you're doing dialogue? Um, not often, uh, occasionally, but, um, you know, mo most, most of the time, uh, I, I can hear it in my head pretty well. In your head pretty well. Yeah. So what, what do you mainly find that you're doing when you're revising? 
adding, cutting, harmonizing? Um, none of the above, usually. Uh -huh. I, uh, I, most of what I've uh, written over the years has been first draft, uh -huh. and, and, and that's been it. Wow. Um, not always, yeah, but, yeah. but but almost mm -hmm. all the time. Okay. Um, though I'll, I'll have worked on the story be, <clears throat> before I get to the end. Right. I'll, uh, there'll be, uh, in that sense, it, right. it, one revises as one goes along. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you're working on, let's say, a short story, okay. and let's say you've done a thousand words, and for whatever reason you step away, and later you go back to it, do you begin by rereading the story from the beginning? And revising it as you go, or do you just, just look at the end right where you stopped? How do you pick back up? Well, I've got kind of a weird memory, so I can, I can pretty much just say, okay, this, this is where I am, yeah, and, and just kind of, kind of pick up wherever it was. Either that or I'm going to just completely hit a wall, and right. reading it over again is not going to help anyway. Okay. How about you? Um, I, I sometimes read over the work. It depends right. how, uh, how vividly I remember right. it. And sometimes when I'm working on a book, um, it turns out that I didn't remember it that vividly, <laughs> and uh -huh. I, I find that out when there are in right. inconsistencies down yeah. the line. Yeah. But normally I'm just concerned with getting words down. Right. So I was, I was working on um, a book recently, and it, it's, it's a mess. I got a rough draft, and, and it's a mess. Um, and one of the reasons that it's a mess is that when I was about three quarters of the way through the draft, I realized that a character I had killed about a quarter of the way through the book, I actually wanted to still be alive. And so I'm like, all right, I'm bringing this guy back, and I'm just going to have to go back and, and fix it later. And that's um, ju Just me. a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, he shot me in the shoulder. Yeah. yeah I mean, do you ever have anything just, just kind of, I don't want to, use too strong a word, but kind of catastrophic happened, like you realize a decision you made early on was just so wrong, it's going to so cost well, you so much more work? Um, it, it, what, what happens with me more often is, is it's like, you know, I'll, 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 get to, I'll get to a point and um, things will have been kind of perking along fine and then it's like, yeah, but yeah, then what happens? And right. Yeah, I'm 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 kind I'm kind of blank, and you mm -hmm. know, um, I think well, if I go back and I and I change this thing from earlier, right? How would it happen differently? But right. too too often too often it's just like well, there was a reason you didn't do it that way to begin with, and so you know, I just I just kind of um, you know, wind up um, getting on Facebook for a while instead. Right. <laughs> do you? Yeah, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, do you work from an outline? Or is it, uh, is very it, infrequently. Very infrequently. Not, not in years that I can recall. Okay. But the way I typically write or have written in, uh, for, for quite some time mm -hmm. has been to go away from wherever I'm living, right. either to a writer's colony or to one of my own making, just take a, an Airbnb flat somewhere uh -huh. and, and, uh, for a, a couple of weeks. And... Uh, ideally write the whole book in whatever time I'm, I'm there. So that does help as far as staying in the mindset of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm by myself, because I'm having limited contact with the, the rest of the world, uh, you know, about the closest I come to interaction is if someone asks me whether I want the coffee black or with <laughs> cream. Uh, I'm very much in the head of the book the whole time, right. so I don't forget, and I don't... It, it, you have to do more than just remember. You have to be in mm -hmm. uh, the work, and that way I, I stay in the work uh, pretty much throughout. And I find that very helpful. What's the, what's the fastest you've ever done a book from start to finish? Well, uh, early days I used to write very, very rapidly. Uh, especially if I had had um, reason to 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 hurry up, so I've I've done books in in less than a week certainly, but those were not very good books mm -hmm. and they were not very long books, and uh, they didn't demand that much work. Uh, they they demanded plenty of work, but they didn't demand that much mental acuity. I don't right. suppose. Right. Yeah. It sounds like my process is very different from 
uh, the two of you. Uh, for me, writing is largely a process of overwriting and then cutting. Yeah. Um, you know, I, my, my writing tends to be, I think, um, on the uh, understated side mm -hmm. most of the time. And often I'll think, you know, I've got a thousand words that are pretty good and I'm happy and I come back the next day and I discover that there's only 300 words that, you know, actually have any reason to exist and I'm just like, ooh, no, and I'm chopping, chopping, chopping. And, um, yeah, um, for, for, me, for me it's more like, um, I don't really take this as a model, but I, I, I kind of see some parallels. Um, the, the famous film director, John Ford, mm -hmm. um, was notorious for doing what he called editing in the camera, which, you know, he, he, would, he would shoot, he, he, you know, he, he, he didn't shoot a lot of stuff that would need to be cut later, which I, right. that, that's, that's a little bit of Elmore Leonard too, I guess. You know, I try to leave out the parts that people skip. But, um, you know, F Ford, apparently Ford's editors either really, really found, he, found it easy because there was nothing left for them to do by the time, you know, mm -hmm. all, all they could do is put together the shots that he actually took, mm -hmm. or they'd find it incredibly frustrating because there wasn't any way, way for them to kind of work in their perspective or anything, but that, you know, I, 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 tend, I tend to do my, my cutting or my constructing in the camera. It's just that, you know, the camera's at the end of my neck. Mm -hmm. Well, let's shift gears and talk about teaching for a minute. Um, you've taught at Newberry for many years. Yes. You're new to the Newberry community teaching our students. Um, so what, what inspires you to, to teach? What gets you motivated uh, every day in the classroom? Um, the, the English philosopher Roger Scruton said that great teachers, and I'm not a great teacher, but you know, I, I, I can aspire. Um, he, 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 said, he said that great teachers, everybody thinks great teachers love their students. And yeah, you know, I do love my students, even the ones with the goiter or whatever. But um, you know, the, what, what I love is the stuff that I teach about. Mm -hmm. I love good writing. I love, you know, I, I love the, the texts. I, I, lo I love you know, reading about Dr. Johnson or, uh, or you know, Chaucer, Chaucer's um, Pardoner's Tale or whatever. And I love that stuff so much. And on the comp level, I just I love good writing. Um, yeah, I love that stuff so much that I want to make sure that it goes on for at least another generation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, I, I get in there and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how often the kids actually catch this, but um, it's like, hey, I know about this stuff that's beautiful. Here, have some of it. Right. And so, yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of similar um, in that what gets me the most excited in a class is when I realize I've gotten my students excited about something that I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I'll just when I'll come into class one day and they will already be talking about what we've read. Um, or I come in and before class even gets started, you know, they're already asking questions or they're telling me something that they've learned on their mm -hmm. own. Um, because something in the reading uh, sparked their interest, and they you know, were finding stuff online and and so on. And it's you know it's when you know you can like that spark mm -hmm. um, that uh, to me it really it really gets exciting. Well, <clears throat> see, you guys are teachers. I'm uh, an imposter. <laughs> uh, I understand now. I understand that. Um, People frequently feel that way when they find themselves in a teaching situation, a whole imposter syndrome and everything. Mm -hmm. But I've um, you know, been doing it now for a few months, and I'm a genuine imposter. <laughs> it's, it, it's really true. Syndrome, nonsense. It's, it's, it's true. Um, so I don't know how to teach. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm been doing two classes at Newberry, as you know. One's a fiction workshop where the students are writing, and the other was uh, is a uh, literature course about crime fiction. Reading crime fiction for pleasure is the description I have of it. And uh, the second course, the literature course, I realized fairly early on that not only didn't I know what I was doing, even if I did, I wouldn't be very good at it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that uh, having them read a book and trying to lead a discussion about it or trying to tell them things about it or anything, um, that's way out of my wheelhouse. 
Um, and I think the, the class has gone fairly well because they've found things to talk about and that, and it's, it's, it's been uh, reasonably interesting for them, I think. But it's not something I'm going to want to do again. Uh, the writing workshop has been very gratifying, and there I do even less. Uh -huh. um, I op we open each session with a free writing exercise mm -hmm. that, that I do, that they do for about 15 minutes. And they do it. They write. I give them a sentence to start with, and they go on for 15 minutes, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, talk, we discuss various things. Sometimes somebody will read something they've written or talk about something they've written. And then there's a big stretch where they boot up their computers. The first exercise is, is handwriting. Okay. But then they boot up their computers and they do what they want. Uh, they have ongoing projects to, to write on mm -hmm. and they write. And you know, I've watched the results and I've seen the amount of writing that gets done. One uh, student uh, wrote a whole play in uh, a matter of weeks. Uh, and another is most of the way through a novel. So they're getting a, a great deal done. And as I s really see probably any writing workshop, but, cer but certainly one for undergraduates, um, I think uh, the whole point of the course, as far as I can see it, mm -hmm. is for them to find themselves as writers and to do so by writing. Traditionally in workshops, and it, it's, it's just the standard uh, bit, is somebody brings in a story and either they read it to the class or I read it to the right. class, and then we discuss it for the rest of the hour. And. I never got the point of that. Right. Not when I was taking that course as an mm -hmm. undergraduate myself, and not right. other times that I've seen it. Yeah. So I, uh, I just love the fact that they're writing and getting work done, and what they come out of it with is of their own making. Right. You know, all I can do is give them space. Yeah. So I've, you know, I've taught classes in exactly the model that you describe because I think in in the realm of, of college uh, fiction writing classes mm -hmm. is just kind of the, the standard yeah. the standard way yeah. that you do it and you know you know that's how everybody else does it and you do it too and it's not I agree it's not terribly satisfying sometimes um, I remember one time I had I felt as though I had an incredible breakthrough with the class because um, we were um, this was um, back in early technological days where a student would have to present me with a paper copy of the story and then I would photocopy it and distribute it and then we would come back next time and, and talk about it. And one thing we've been talking about in this class was the importance of quick beginnings, you know, not, you know, not two pages of ponderous description of a sunset or whatever, but you know, just really um, get busy. And I, I suggested to them that maybe what you need to do is kind of write your way to the beginning and then when you find where your story actually starts and you can cut what comes before and so on and so forth. Um, and so we sat down and we're, we're talking about the story that I distributed the class before and the opening of this story was great. It, it, it was interesting, it grabbed you, it started fast, it plunged you uh, within a paragraph or two of everything that was important about this story. And um, I said to my students, you know, this, you know, this is what we've been talking about. This is the best example we've seen uh, of the beginning of a story so far. And so, you know, everybody talked about how, how good they thought it was. And then the guy who had wrote the story kind of sheepishly raised his hand and um, I said, yes. And he said, I've got to be honest, you didn't copy the first page of my story. <laughs> Oh, that's priceless. Yeah. And, and I said, well, there you go. You know, that's exactly what we've been saying. Right. Uh, cut the stuff at the beginning. So uh, Write the second chapter first. Write the yeah. second chapter first, yeah. yeah. So do you see any connection between the writing that you do personally and, and what you do in the classroom, your own stuff, and what goes on in class? Um, a little bit, just in, in, not, not, so, not so much in terms of the product, mm -hmm. but in, in, in terms of... You know, I, I know I know what it's like to 
have gone through these, to, to have been in, in workshops. I know what it's like to be you know, scared to death when, oh my God, they're going to tear me to shreds over this. And so for me, I, I think, I think a, lot of, a lot of my work um, is just to ma make it a, I don't want to use the word safe space because that's taken on so much baggage, but um, I, I want to make it a useful space. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a, a space where, you know, okay, we, you know, we know you're nervous about this. We're all nervous about having to find things to say about it, but you know, it's going to be okay. And you know, um, this, this is just this, this is a this is a place where you know you can bring your work in, and, and you know, I, I, I try to make it the kind of environment that, that I wanted and sometimes didn't find when I was taking right. workshops. What about in a literature classroom? You're, you're teaching, you know, Life of Johnson or something. Right, right. Is, is there any, inter any intersection there? Um, well, there as much as anything, um, what I've got to do is, is I've got to spend a lot of time creating background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, j just because um, a as, as the late Harlan Ellison once said, um, for, you know, for people, for most people, nostalgia equals breakfast. And, um, you know, there, there, there's, there's so, so much, there's so much history to make sure that people can get the jokes. Mm -hmm. And so I have to spend a lot of time kind of painting scenery and stuff like right. that before we can even get to the actual cool stuff that's happening in the text. Mm -hmm. um, with, with somebody like Johnson, who, you know, you've got so many wonderful anecdotes about right. the guy, you know, it, it, it's, it's not hard to kind of hook somebody, hook somebody mm -hmm. into, oh, well, this, this guy sounds like an interesting cat. But um, on the other hand, if you're trying, say, um, Dryden's Absalom and Achitophel, you know, it's yeah. like, which I don't try that anymore. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. ha having to explain about, well, uh, there was this guy named Monmouth, you know, that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing, that, that, that can be some pretty heavy skull sweat. Mm -hmm. How much you and your students do you, do you bring? How much do you bring your own life as a writer into the classroom uh, when you're just you know trying to get them to produce their own writing? Well, sometimes uh, we'll be talking about writing or mm -hmm. publishing, and I'll, I'll think of something, sure. you know, from uh, my own experience. And sometimes I just uh, well, for example, um, yesterday I was in the uh, in the uh, afternoon class, mm -hmm. the literature class. And I forget what triggered it, but I found myself talking about the fact that I was kind of bummed out because the book that I uh, most recently completed, I was not uh, finding a satisfactory publisher for it. Mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I, I guess uh, I don't know what they get from that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the, the shocking realization that the professor is human. Uh -huh. but. Um, He's kidding, of course. We're not. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I just found that uh, being present in the class requires a certain amount of candor for me. Mm -hmm. So have you ever had the experience uh, in class, uh, Warren, of your students being surprised to discover that you've ever written anything? Yes. Um, last, last semester in one of my freshman comp classes, um, I had a student who was working on a paper for another class, and right. she, was, she was vetching a little bit. And she said, I have to write this 10-page paper. And she turns to me and says, Dr. Moore, have you ever had to write a 10-page paper? And I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. And I uh, kind, of uh, kind of explained that, you know, what a dissertation was. And, right. you know, what, what, and, you know if, if you live in academia like we do, it's it's kind of easy to forget that you know, most people don't live there, right. and um, so you know you, you, you sometimes have, have to say, well, yeah, you know, I, the, these these are the things that I had to do to, to get right. this job, and and you know this is part of this is how we talk about things and how we think about things, right. and um, so yeah, I, I wound up you know gra gra grabbing that beaten up old copy of my dissertation and bringing it in and saying. Thud, you know, here if, if you, you know, if you ever have trouble sleeping, this will do the trick for you. But uh, and you know, just show, them, yeah, th this is this is how we do this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that you know, for many of our students, particularly our freshmen, mm -hmm. you know, you and I are just, you know, the, the 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 human version of that name that happens to appear on on their course schedule, and that's kind of the ex the ubiquitous professor staff. Yeah, it's the extent yeah. it's the extent of what we are. But in your situation, you walked into a couple of classrooms where your students knew that they were being given a special opportunity. 
Um, and so I, I don't know who kind of <laughs> thinking that, but the, we I, might have had something to do yeah, with that. I suspect but, you did. But I wondered, have you ever gotten a sense in either class, especially the writing class, that your students are kind of intimidated and they're like, "Oh, Professor Block, I'm not sure I want you to see this." Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, there's no requirement that they show me anything. Okay. <laughs> um, I, and um, but one thing. Uh, I was thinking of when, when uh, Warren was talking, uh, that you, you may not know. Uh, a student in uh, my class, mm -hmm. I had, had talked about having gone to your psych <coughs> psychopathy class, mm -hmm. uh, the one at which uh, Warren was, uh, was speaking. Right. And one fellow said that he'd one time been at a reading mm -hmm. where both you and Warren read stories. Right. Dark stories, I assume, uh -huh. because he said that the effect on him was that he emerged from it convinced that you were both psychopaths, <laughs> and he was afraid to be in the same room with you. So mission accomplished. There you go. <laughs> that may be our theme. There you go. Beware, beware. <laughs> That's funny. Uh -huh. um, so one piece of, of uh, advice for an aspiring writer, and it can't be a piece of advice that's ever been given before. Well, I think they've all been given. I know. Um, <laughs> so what's your favorite piece of advice? Um, lie in a dark room until the feeling passes. No, um, honestly, and I, I know this is going to sound like sucking up, and maybe it is a little bit, but um, the, 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 re the, reason, the reason I met Lawrence Block was because you know, I, I had run across some of his books on writing, mm -hmm. and, uh, writing the novel from plot to print and now to pixel, and um, Spider Spin Me a Web, and um, Telling Lies for Fun and Profit. And I read those, and you know, because I had been in workshops and stuff like that, I had read all these kind of mystical, touchy-feely, um, considering the whiteness of the whale kind of things. And I, th I found Larry's books to be just eminently practical mm -hmm. and answering the kind of question. And it made sense because the these were basically columns he had written for Writer's Digest right. for years. And I saw those and it's like, okay, these are the kind of questions that I get from kids. I'm going to start using these as, as textbooks. And if, if anybody's serious about, want, or yeah, for whatever reason, writing, whether it's for publication or just, you know, to, just because it's what you need to do and you're this kind of irritable organism that produces words, um, yeah, I, my, my advice would be to, to check, out, check out those book, books by, by Larry. And, when I, and I can vouch for them as a teacher, because when I used them with my kids, they were like, oh, yeah, the, these, are, these are great. And in fact, I, 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 found, I found Larry's website back about 10, 12 years ago, and all I wanted to do was just say, hey, you know, my kids really like your books, and who knew the guy answered his own email? So, you know, that, that's, that's really kind of how we met, but that, that would be my advice. Re, ch check, out, check out those books because they, they, are, you know, they, they are encouraging and they are eminently practical. Okay. And so if you were not going to say, buy my book, <laughs> what would you say? I, 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 I wouldn't say that. I would say if I had to pick one bit of, bit of advice, write to please yourself. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so much of, uh, oh, so much of instruction about writing, um, not necessarily at, at colleges, but at mm -hmm. uh, or in writers' conferences and things like that. So much of uh, it is market-oriented and what editors want and how to do this and how to do that. And I think that's all uh, nonsense. I, I think it's uh, something one should not be considering, that uh, given the relative rewards in this occupation, uh, if you're not pleasing yourself, you're really missing a bad. Right. And also that, uh, that the only really good work is done by someone who's uh, trying to write for his own satisfaction. I was going to say, you know, one of the, the earlier topics we talked about, you know, what, do you have any overarching themes or whatnot uh, in your writings? Um, actually, the first answer that popped into my head about that question was, uh, my overarching theme is David finds this entertaining. Um, which is very much the yeah, same. Yeah, there are worse yeah. targets to hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is very much the same thing, is that you know, I think of whatever it is that mm -hmm. I find provocative or amusing or whatever, and I keep writing it in a way that I hopefully continue to find mm -hmm. you know, 
whatever, and it, it kind of progresses from there. And, and you know, I, I, I occasionally I'll have kids who say, well, you know, um, th this, this kind of stuff looks like it would be easy to ride. I don't like it much, but I think it would sell. And I say, well, for one thing, if you're, going, if you're going in thinking about it that way, I think on some level the contempt kind of shows through mm -hmm. for, for the kind of stuff, you know, it, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're writing, if you're writing something and it's not something that, that you would like to read anyway, right. then, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, there, there's, there's just something about it that kind of queers the deal. Yeah, to a degree. Uh, on the other hand, I've known an awful lot of cases of people whose initial inspiration is, gee, I could do better than this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes they can, and often they can't, but it, it uh, uh, <clears throat> imbues them with sufficient confidence to do the whole thing to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I think trying to write a kind of book that you don't like mm -hmm. is, uh, is foolhardy. Mm -hmm. I also know this happens a lot more with poetry, I think, than with writers of fiction, but that's that it's uh, people attempt to write it who've never made much of an attempt to read it. There are more poets every year than there are poetry books uh, read. You know, it, 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 it works that way. I mean, one of the things I tell my students is that you, know, you should be write, reading a lot of whatever it is that you want to write. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I, I've had numerous students um, over the years who have been working on a genre novel and you have wanted me to read the first three chapters. Um, and I'm always willing to do that, but it's usually the case that I can say, well, I can give you some general tips, general direction um, based on just kind of broad, mm -hmm. uh, broad issues related to, to writing fiction. But if you're in a genre that I don't ever read, you know, you're I, going it, to send them to me. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's, I'm limited what I can do. And it's, it's usually a fantasy novel. Right. And I just don't read fantasy novels. And so mm -hmm. I just, I don't have a lot of reference for knowing mm -hmm. if they're, you know, ticking the boxes that they're supposed to be right. ticking for a book mm -hmm. of this type. Yeah. So a student goes through one of your classes, literature, fiction, okay. whatever. Um, what do you hope their big, their big takeaways are? What, what do you hope when they, when they look back on their time with Dr. Moore, Professor Block, what, what do you hope it is that they, they um, think about? Well, I, I don't, while, while, I, while I hope they maybe have found a couple of lines or something that might stick in their head 20 or 30 years from now, I, I actually usually ask, ask my students on the final exam, so yeah, here's a clue, everybody. Um, you know, what, what's the point of studying this stuff in 2019 or you know, whenever we happen to be? And um, you know, in, in, a, in a literature class, uh, I, what, what I often hope people find is that you know, even though these people were, even though these people have been dead for 300 years or whatever, um, that you know, people really, people really haven't changed that much. We still kind of, you know, the technology has changed, but people's basic wants and needs and pain and pleasure are, you know, those, those things may not have changed all that much and, you know, people have been wrestling with these ideas for a very long time and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a chance to see what some, what some very smart people thought about this stuff at some point or other. Mm -hmm. How about you? What's the question? The question is, what do you hope that your students oh, what, take what, away what from I the classes? What I hope they take away from? Yeah. I know, uh, I've I forget where the quote came from, but I, I knew a fellow who had it on his wall, and it, it said the the uh, the most successful teacher is one whose students uh, walk away uh, knowing that they did it all themselves. <laughs> uh, so you know, mm -hmm. it, <clears throat> but uh, what I hope I I don't know. It's going to vary. Um, I, as I said, I, my whole focus in the writing class was to give people mm -hmm. space to uh, find themselves. And, you know, when it comes to things like, like grading, I mean, how on earth do you grade something like that? Uh, they come in with different abilities, they mm -hmm. marshal different things, and, and it isn't even the amount, the amount that they get written because mm -hmm. it may serve them best to write more or to write less. Uh, and I just, um, I, I hope they'll have um, 
come a little closer to self-realization mm -hmm. through writing than they mm -hmm. were at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I think that in the literature class especially, but all, also through um, writing classes on those rare occasions where I, I, I get to teach a creative writing class, um, I hope that somehow my students will just become more engaged with the world around them, more mm -hmm. aware, um, and that literature can be a, a conduit for that. Um, I often tell my students a story about something that happened to me my freshman year of college. Um, I had a friend uh, in my dorm who was obsessed with a, a young woman, and he was constantly coming into my dorm room and telling me things that she had said that he thought were profound. And I usually just rolled my eyes and was like, <laughs> that, yeah, that's great. Uh, and one time he came into my room and he said, David, he said, get a load of this. Here's what she said today. She said, have you ever noticed how many different shades of the color green there are? And I said to my friend whose name was also David, I said, yeah, that's, that's, that's great, David. Thanks for that. And reader, he married her. No. Yeah, no. And, then, and then an hour or two later, I walked out of my dorm and I looked around and it was, oh my God, there are so many shades of green in the world. And I was, I was I mean, it really was like, I've never really noticed that before. And see, I was more likely to hang out with people who were sniffing gasoline. <laughs> so it was like, okay, yeah. I see that's red and you see that's red, but how do we know what we're seeing is the same thing, whoa. Yeah, so, and, you know. so, and so I actually tried to use, you know, get my students to a higher level of perception in the world around them you know, in their writing and also in the way in, in which they engage and what they read and you know, how that makes them more aware of things. Um, and I tell them we can, you know, we can begin with something you know, that's kind of, you know, kind of a superficial observation of no particular importance beyond the fact that it illustrates um, a lot of us just don't pay much attention, right. uh, don't pay much attention to things. Um, so let's look ahead. Uh, your own current writing projects. What 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 have we got going on here? Um, well, um, I, I have I have part of a novel that I had um, d I'd done about ten eleven thousand words, mm -hmm. and um, I had what I thought was going to be an opportunity for a big break when a big name agent said, I'd like to see this. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I discovered is that there are a few things more terrifying than the chance at having a big break. But um, I, I, I tried it and he, he didn't like it. And I just kind of got despondent for a while. But recently I've, I've kind of thought there might, be, there might be more that can be done with that. So I mm -hmm. uh, bounced, it, bounced it off somebody I respect very much. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, oh, there, there might be something here. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to see if there might be something there. Right. Okay. And you don't write as much as you used to? No, but, I don't. But I, I, I keep thinking that I'm retiring. Uh -huh. And uh, someone said, well, you, you may be shy, but you're not retiring. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I finished a book this spring, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have to make a decision somewhere along the line whether or not I want to self-publish it mm -hmm. or find, find some way to do it that way because it's one that's important enough to me so that I, I want it done right. reasonably well. Sure. Uh, after that, I don't have any writing planned, but then this most recent book came as a surprise to me. Right. It started off as a, a short story I didn't think I wanted to bother with, and it grew into a novel and then. So I've learned not to rule that out. Mm -hmm. uh, I've uh, got a sufficient uh, impulse to write and to make things out of something so that I, I, uh, I expect there'll be another work of fiction. If, and if my mind holds up and my, right. my body, those two frail systems. Right. Uh, and I'm also, I'm putting together right now a book of, uh, of hitherto uncollected uh, nonfiction mm -hmm. of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, there's another uh, book that I'm editing. They're, they're, I, I can't seem to get away from my desk is what it amounts to, but w whether or not there'll be um, new fiction coming along, right. I suspect there will, but I don't know when. How about you? You mentioned that you've got a book yeah. in progress. So I have that. It's a mess. Um, I need to. That's my goal for this coming summer. Mm -hmm. Is that you know I need some 
relatively uninterrupted time to kind of obsess uh, about exactly what I've created and how to get the, the whole thing tightened up. It has the additional challenge of the fact that I to did not have an outline. I totally winged it. I had a general idea about what I was going to do, but the, the plot is, is not chronological and mm -hmm. it's jumping all around. Um, and so I, it's kind of a mess. Um, so I, I, gotta, I gotta figure out what to do with that. Um, is yeah, kind of a mess doesn't look good on the flap of the <laughs> that's book. Right. Yeah. That's right. Um, that explains why that blurb didn't go. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a mess, but maybe you'll find something here to like. Yeah. Um, and as well, um, as, as you two know, I'm, um, in as much as there's such a thing as an expert in a writer that not very many people care about, um, I've done a lot of work on a 1950s noir writer uh, named Gil Brewer. Um, I've written introductions to a, a couple of his, actually four of his novels that have been reprinted. I've edited uh, three volumes of his stories, and I have figured out where the finish line is. Um, I've got one more introduction to write for a couple of his novels that are being reprinted. I have one last collection of his short stories uh, that I'm going to edit, and then I'm done. Done, done, done. No, no, you're not done. No? Oh. No, then <clears throat> at that point, that's when you start quietly, surreptitiously uh -huh. writing yourself uh, <clears throat> hitherto unknown stories by Gil Brewer. <laughs> well, so, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, I've, I've had thoughts like that. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm that not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, particularly um, when I'm pulling, pay, uh, pulling stories from these uh, magazines that he wrote under other names, or look what I found that no one was new in the archives, and I could totally just slide in something that I wrote and nobody would ever know. Um, and maybe I have. Um, so um, last topic of conversation, um, let's talk for a moment about Larry's time here at Newberry College, what it's meant to you, what it's meant to the college, what maybe it's meant to you uh, personally. Um, I, I've, been, I've been delighted that, 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 you, that you've been able to come down here. I mean, it was, you know, for, for years, uh, you know, we, we've had the visiting author program and the, the Girding visiting author program, thanks to the generosity of the Girding family. But, um, you know, I, 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 think, I think because so many of the kids we get are, um, you know, are, are, are not necessarily immersed in the world of letters, mm -hmm. um, the, the, ch the chance for them to, to actually spend time with real writers, trademark pending, um, and, and realize that, yeah, you know, writers are people who do a job and who, and, you know, who, who, who think about these things and that, that they are actual human beings instead of just names on the spines of books. I, I think, actually, that we're just one rung lower than the angels myself, but <laughs> what, whatever you say. Sure, sure. Um, although, you know, far, far fewer of us can dance on the head of a pin. But, um, no, um, and, you know, from, from a personal standpoint, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, um, I, I've, I've, been, I've been very honored to, um, to Get to get to uh, call Larry a friend of mine over mm -hmm. the, over the past decade or so, and um, you know, it delights me to have the opportunity to spend time around somebody I like that much. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I have viewed all this um, a lot of the time just from the, the point of view of an administrator, for better or for mm, worse. Sure. And my thought all along has been, I hope that this is, in broad terms, a good experience for everybody. Yeah. Uh, you know, I hope the students enjoy the classes. I hope that Larry isn't sitting in his temporary quarters every night thinking, why am I in South Carolina? You know, I just hope that everybody ends up pleased. And I just know that if, if everybody ends up pleased, it's that means it, it will, it will, in some way it will have been a win for everybody. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that that's what's been happening. Well, I certainly hope the college is pleased and that the students are pleased. I, get, I hear that they are, but you know, what else am I going to hear? Mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, um, I've just enjoyed myself enormously uh, without ever losing sight of the fact that I'm an imposter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I like the college. I, I love walking on the campus. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Uh, the students are bright and responsive and uh, remarkably polite for the, the year of our Lord, 2019. 
And, uh, and I've fallen in love with the town. Mm -hmm. Lynn and I both have, to the point where we uh, took an apartment mm -hmm. uh, on Main Street for occasional use and that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also, you have to realize that I come to all of this um, not with uh, a trunk full of degrees, but the only diploma I have was given to me by Bennett High School in Buffalo, New York, a long, a long time ago. I had a few years at college, and uh, and that did not lead to a degree. I, I left before then, and uh, so as a result, it it had been a, a persuasive fantasy uh, for me to be in a situation like this sometime, and. Uh, most of the time, it's a very hazardous to bring a fantasy to fruition because it's almost always disappointing. Mm -hmm. As uh, as I could give examples that I that we need <laughs> that here, but uh, and in this case, I've I've really enjoyed myself. I've I've felt at sea occasionally. I've felt tired a lot, but I've enjoyed it a great deal, and. I just can't stop thinking how proud my mother would be. Oh, that's very nice. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, thank thank you. you for this conversation, and we hope that you've enjoyed hearing from us.